Do vaccines provide net benefit in the context of public health? That's the crux of the debate always. It's also the question I address in the big picture. So let's look at the big picture, picture that involves infant immunity and brain function. This picture is designed to show you how I see a baby and its potential downfall. If you want your baby to have a chance to grow up to be healthy with all of its cogs functioning normally, you should make sure that nothing interferes with the immunologic programming, especially during the first three years of life. Anything eaten, injected, breathed, for instance, which creates damage or stress, has the potential to change the DNA instruction manual of protein synthesis and lead to system malfunction. After 21 years of being a medical doctor, working as a kidney specialist for part of that time, and teaching in academic institutions for part of that time, and studying the science intensively, especially over the past four years, and my recent years of listening to the disenfranchised parents of wounded children, it's my conclusion that the most efficient way to destroy a life is to indiscriminately agree to use everything considered best practice or gold standard in the aggressive interventionist medical model of today, which is often based on reductionist science, produced by industry and encouraged by government agencies. The medical system used to consider the first months of pregnancy developmentally vulnerable, though that appears to have gone out the window with new directives in the United States to vaccinate pregnant mothers with a variety of vaccines, most of which contain aluminum. So looked at from a purely biological and immunological perspective, though, the three-year pregnancy, as we call it, must be considered. This is a schematic uh, that a friend and, and myself uh, came up with together when we were thinking about this. Some medical researchers are starting to see that there is a highly orchestrated, amazingly intricate metabolic and immune system blueprint, which is highly influential upon the normal growth and development of brains and immune systems. And that's what's at stake here, right? Brains and immune systems. The microbiome, which is all the bacteria and viruses and fungi that are supposed to be living in you and on you, the immune system and the nervous systems are interdependent and intimately related. The strengths and weaknesses of that child in their future lives are determined in part before gestation by the health of the parents and the diet of the parents, during gestation by what the mother is doing and what, by, by what the medical system is doing to the mother, what she's thinking and how she's feeling, and during the first two years of that baby's life after it's born. That's what I call constituting the three-year pregnancy, which is depicted schematically here. So this whole circle is the three-year pregnancy. This uh, denotes the period of time before um, conception, where it's been shown that the diet even of the father has an impact on how that baby will turn out. And then we have the pregnancy period here. And this is a continuum because once um, pregnancy starts, there's a shift in the mother's immune system. And it's basically to create a balance so that that, that that trophoblast doesn't invade through her and that so she doesn't reject it at the same time. So her immune system basically goes anti-inflammatory. And the whole goal during this situation is to keep that baby anti-inflammatory. And so the microbiome of the mother is key to that. Then towards right before birth, she shifts into a pro-inflammatory situation and her microbiome changes again. And that is key to triggering labor, actually. Then we have birth, and at that point, there's another shift to dampen down all the catecholamines and the inflammation that's necessary to have a normal, healthy vaginal delivery. Then we have the two years afterwards, and we have a continuation of the mother's immunity. Uh, they're still connected, and the breast milk takes over. And so we have the infant gut microbiome that has to be established, and that's extremely important that that happens on time and with the right microbes, and it's not interfered with with antibiotics just in case for all sorts of situations to the mother and the baby. And then um, towards the end of that, the baby graduates, and the baby actually's immune system will turn slightly pro-inflammatory, and that's where we live during health, and there are reasons for that. I don't have time to get into the details of it today, though. So, this is what I'm going to be talking about today, so if you didn't take all that in right now, don't worry, because I'm going to be repeating myself over and over, and because this is filmed, and you can go back and watch it later. Um, most of my slides will have PMID, PubMed numbers, on them, where you can actually go and get the articles that I'm referring to. At the core of this is a factory inside every cell 
responsible for listening to, responding to, and sometimes defending itself from its environment. And it's not all about genes. There's a revolution in genetics and biology that's reshaping the way scientists once thought about inheritance and our genetic fate. It's a game changer. The epigenome is the conductor of the blueprint manual. DNA is just a blueprint. It has no activity by itself, okay? So epigenome means above the genome. And this is a whole system of signals which either tightens and shuts down or opens up and activates sections of DNA to make proteins, which can produce different results depending on the signals they receive from the outside world. Those signals can come from drugs, food, chemicals, social stress, and even the predominant tenor of an individual's thoughts. And epigenetic changes are also inheritable. The scientists used to think that the slate was wiped clean uh, during conception, but now we know that epigenetic changes that happen to your baby or that happen to your grandmother can be passed down and can magnify with each successive generation. Obviously, this doesn't just apply to humans, it applies to animals, it, and it's most quickly seen and recognized by home gardeners. Here is a really obvious example of epigenetic differences. These are two different plants with the same genetic seed planted the same year. This is an Italian tomato called a Capri. The seeds are the same. The big difference is the quality of the soil, the watering, and the sun levels. And the outcome, as you can see, is dramatically different even to the untrained eye. This, this plant here might get 10, 20 tomatoes if you're lucky. This one had over 100. What tomato plants get to eat has a huge bearing on how they grow. And the same applies to animals and to humans. All mammals have a gene called agouti, but that gene can become mutant. And when a mouse's mutant agouti gene is completely unmethylated, its coat is yellow like that, and it's obese, and it's prone to diabetes, cancer and cancer, and when the agouti gene is methylated, and I'll tell you in a minute what methylated and unmethylated is, the coat color is brown, like this one here, and the mouse has a low disease risk is th and is also thin and normal shaped. So fat yellow mice and skinny brown mice are genetically identical, okay? The fat yellow mice are different because they've had an epigenetic change that occurred from the, the amount of B12 and folate and choline that the mother ate while she was pregnant with this mouse, okay? So she didn't get enough folic acid, vitamin B12 and choline. The, this agouti mutant will end up like this, and if she gets enough, this one is what will come out. So this is an example showing how genes are activated, and it's a more common issue than the genes themselves and just what's in the DNA. So what denotes environment? This is a really important question because anything outside your cells actually constitutes environment. So whether it's inside or outside your body. And variations in the environment can make an instant change. Just as folic acid, B12, and choline make big changes in these mice, environmental changes in a pregnant woman can do exactly the same thing. To start to understand what makes a healthy child, we have to understand that the old central dogma that many of us may have learned in college, I did, for, for instance, that our, that our genes control us, that that's not true. Our genes don't control us. They are read out manual, they're, sorry, they are read out manuals with lots of different options dependent upon the owner. DNA is only responsible for about 10% of how we turn out. You know all that junk DNA we were told about? Well, guess what? It's not junk. And blueprints like DNA have no activity or power on their own. They're controlled from outside. So let's get rid of that old dogma and let me show you this. And I'll explain this, so don't worry. What this is is a schematic of a cell. So imagine this membrane going all the way around like this and then inside you have cytoplasm and with all kinds of miraculous things going on and then you have the nucleus at the very center uh, inside and this is the genetic material, the DNA, all right? Each cell membrane of every one of your cells has around 100,000 protein switches that open and close to various substances and send signals inside depending on what's happening out here, the environment. Signal transduction is what this is called, and it's key to when and which proteins are made in the cell and how that cell will function. 
Our environment does most of the controlling through these cell membranes. Thus, the nucleus is not the brain of the cell, like we used to think. In fact, some cells live for up to two months with no nucleus at all. But no cell lives without a membrane. If you interrupt these processes in the membrane, the cell will become dysfunctional. Death or life messages can be sent through those membranes into the nucleus, and that's what determines whether you grow normally, grow wrong, or mutate. 90% of what comes from the blueprint of your genes is controlled by what the cell surface encounters. The broth your cells are exposed to can be stress hormones or endorphins, nutrients or starvation, inflammation or non-inflammation, and on and on. So what made the difference in those agouti mice was not their mutant genes, but how those genes responded to the environment their cells were bathing in, whether those cells were marinating in proper nutrients or not. That's the basis of epigenetics. DNA is typically represented by the double helix, as you're probably all familiar with, and these are three main, there are three main mechanisms by which genes are epigenetically expressed or suppressed. It's called DNA methylation, which is right here. So let's just go over this. This is what a chromosome looks like when it's all curled up inside the nucleus. But if you uncurl this, it's probably miles long. And then you uncurl it, and then it comes, this is a, a secondary form right here, and then it uncurls even further. And then these little things are coils inside that are called histones. Uh, sorry, there's a big one right there. And then that can uncoil even further and then this is what you're used to seeing as the double helix. So we've got lots of twisting going on here and, and, and covering up. So most of the DNA is, is inside and it's not accessible um, until it's woken up and told what to do, okay? So the, the main mechanisms are methylation, and methyl is just a, it's a, it's a chemical group that can sit on here, and it sits on a particular um, base and will either activate the gene or tell it to stay asleep. Then we can have acetylation of these histone proteins, or the coils, and it's kind of like your garden hose, actually, you know, how you can wind it up. And um, so if, if this becomes acetylated, then this unwinds and the DNA becomes exposed. And then we have something really miraculous and amazing, and this is microRNA. And this is another revolution in understanding of genetics that's going on today, because microRNA is everywhere. It's in breast milk, it's in cow's milk, it's, it's in food, it's in the placenta, and has all kinds of activity that was previously unappreciated. So how or when any of this, uh, this, this epigenetic alteration occurs is largely dependent upon what that cell membrane is encountering. Here's what can happen to genes in the nucleus after the membrane is stimulated. In which areas are the epigenetic effects prominent? Well, pretty much everywhere. Health problems rarely occur in isolation. This, they exist as part of a pattern or superstructure of health risks across a lifetime. Every word on this slide has an impact on epigenetics. I don't have time to talk about all of it today. I've researched thoroughly. I've got papers to show just about every one of these things is true. So this is just a brief overview of how a baby's immune system develops and what might happen if you put vaccines into that. That's what we're going to talk about today. But vaccines aren't the only factor, and that's what I want to point out here today. Stress from any source on this slide are all shown to be highly influential in a neonate's development. Epigenetic factors play a huge role and are unappreciated role in disease development, also in how drugs affect you or how vaccines affect you, that can no longer be ignored because the science is blossoming over the importance of the cell environment. If a mother makes this choice, a baby can be programmed into an inflammatory phenotype, meaning how they look from the outside, how they're expressing and living. But this choice can do the opposite. Parents often don't know what they need to know in order to make the best choices because they don't get to hear the voices which can inform them so they can make different choices. Parents are mostly maneuvered into a one-size-fits-all medical model, but parents have to live with the consequences of their choices. When it comes to conventional medical care, vaccines, and so many interventions, not only are most medical doctors not informed about the biochemical results of their, of their daily practice, I certainly wasn't, but they often adamantly deny the effects of their interventions and seem hardened to the consequences of what they deny or don't understand. And I know there are parents in this room that can testify to that fact. 
for parents to make ideal choices, they need to know what the biological foundations really are. Normally at this point, I'd spend some time talking about pregnancy and some of the amazing things that happen during those 38 weeks, but I can't do that today. But I do want to mention one particular thing because it's crucial to discussion later on, and that is the factory inside the mother that makes the baby.